Uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Stretch Hoff. I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project here at the Hamilton County Library. And today we have Ed Shadler with us, and uh, he was with the Merchant Marines, and we're going to discuss his story. Uh, welcome, Ed. Okay, thank you. Yeah, right. And uh, like we said earlier, just start off with uh, where you were born and raised, and uh, we'll go we'll on from there. Okay. I was born and raised in Alexandria, Kentucky, Campbell County, south of uh, Alexandria, south of uh, Newport, and south of Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, in 1944, I was a senior in high school at Campbell County High School, and I had a friend who um, wanted to join the merchant, merchant Siemens, the merchant marine. And at that time, I think the casualties in Europe were large and for some reason, he didn't want no part of that. So uh, I was convinced by him to, to go with him to enlist on merchant ships. And we did that and then after a long process, the recruiting office was at Eighth and Broadway in Cincinnati, and and um, uh, we went there. I mean, on a regular basis for three or four days for different reasons, and then um, the final night we were going from uh, one small room to another, about four or five rooms, and I was the lead man. I was first, and he was to be behind me. And um, um, I would sign this document and that document, so forth, and then finally got down to the last room. And um, the officer, it was a, a Coast Guard officer, and um, I was signing the paper and someone tapped me on my shoulder, and it was uh, Mr. Stefan or Raymond Stefan, that was my, my buddy. And he said, I'll meet you out in, the, um, out in the car. He said, I didn't pay us. So I was in alone. I really didn't know too much what I was into, but I, I know that I'd done, been committed uh -huh. and I was to go alone. So after um, signing up and so forth, there was a short period of time, maybe, oh, maybe a week or two, and we were to leave for the um, training in Brooklyn that uh, the base was, uh, uh, Sheepshed Bay, and it was in Brooklyn, New York, and adjoining our base was the Coast Guard base, training base. And uh, um, when we left Cincinnati, uh, the weather was fairly good, and, and there was, of all of the people that went through the recruiting station, when we left, we only had nine, and then there was only, um, 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 Eight, well, all nine went, and then um, before the training was over with, the other boy from Kentucky, a man named Bill Adams, died on the base. So <clears throat> when we finished in Brooklyn, our original nine was down to eight. Mm -hmm. And then from there we were sent to um, downtown New York. To, we stayed at one of the hotels in downtown New York. And then we were sent out from there to different cities. And I was sent to Boston. And I was the only one that went to Boston. Sometimes they would go in pairs to uh, Seattle or Baltimore or somewhere. But anyway, uh, um, I went to Boston alone. And uh, the first vessel I was on was the um, SS Harry Bowen. And it was running coastwise, mm -hmm. and it would run out of Boston and Salem and Portland, Maine, and it would uh, it was hauling uh, uh, some some trips we hauled coal, but we was running there to Norfolk and back, and then after about ten weeks of that there, why uh, I got off and I switched over and I went I went on a tanker, a, a bulk tanker, the. Um, the name of it was the SS Malay, and it was really 
a, a rust pot. I mean, it was uh, it was sort of a junky ship, but it they said they were so badly needed that they couldn't lay it up, so it run year in year out. Let me uh, go ahead. Let me go back a step. Uh, when you were in training, mm -hmm. what 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 did you do? What were you trained for, and, and how long were you there? And well, I think we were in training probably about 12 weeks, mm -hmm. and and uh, everything uh, to uh, operate in a, a, a freighter or a tanker, cargo ships, and then uh, like steering and swimming and and um, protecting cargo, shifting cargo at sea, and. Um, 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 look at a lot. I mean, you're always looking for scopes mm -hmm. and so forth, but I mean, uh, I was, I, well, mine was in the deck department. I mean, they had three departments on freighters, the engine room, the sorts department, and the deck crew. Mm -hmm. And the deck crew did everything other than what they did in the engine room with the, with the boilers and so forth. I mean, we didn't do anything with them, but uh, docking and undocking and Cargo moving and car securing cargo at sea, and and uh, you'd get um, seven and a half hours a day on the wheel. I mean, uh, steering. You you did that. You were oh yeah. Ship no, too? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. And then I mean, the ocean steering was easy, but when you get into the tight spots, uh, like uh, going inland. Yeah. I mean, I I know we went. Uh, in in Argentina, we went into Rosario, Argentina. We anchored at at Buenos Aires because you could only run the river at daytime, not at night. And then we went inland, and then um, it was something similar to the Licking River, with a, with about a 500 foot, 480 foot ship, and you had to get that up <laughs> up that river, right? And you had to allow for. The, the length of the ship. I mean, if you were making a left turn, you would have the bow pretty close to the shore, not in the not in the bottom, because you got to allow for your prop is on the stern. Yeah. And I, I would see them a lot of times chop up mud. Yeah. I mean, if you didn't know what, well, it's, it was part of it. I mean, you would you would uh, it was turns in the river all different depths and all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, Made but, it difficult, yeah. Right. Well, let's go back to, the, I interrupted you, but you were, back, you were on the rust bucket, you called it, and, and uh, so pick up from your story from that point. Well, there was a lot of vessels lost at sea, and then where they would, where they would um, take them in and do different things to them in shipyards, they just keep them running. I mean, as uh, long, long as they keep that engine, they didn't care what they looked like. Right. Because more than likely, I wouldn't say more than likely, but it was likely that what you were riding on might end up down at the bottom of the ocean anyway. Mm -hmm. So the appearance up on up on top didn't mean that much. Yeah. But well, <coughs> excuse me, I would uh, um, you'd see some of them looked horrible, but they were getting the job done. Mm -hmm. Now you were 18 years old now, 18 or 19 years 18, old. 18. I was right? 18. Okay. Yeah. I was 18 in September, and I think I joined in October or November. Okay. But I mean, it really, it was, um, you could join or you could wait. I mean, uh, if you didn't join that there, why, you would have been probably drafted. And, and that was one thing he told me one time. He says, everybody they're taking is going into the infantry, and, he, and I don't want to go there. And I said, I'm with you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you were tell us where you were shipping uh, from that point on, and well, I, I, uh, on the trips, the various trips. Uh, uh, the first ship was uh, pretty much running coastwise, and the second one was the tanker. I was hauling uh, from Los Pedros, Venezuela, uh, Aruba, in the Gulf, and. Um, it was mainly black oil, mm -hmm. and you would go into um, um, the Delaware River in Philadelphia, and 
there was a city called Marcus Hook, and all the big refineries out, I don't know the names of those other cities now, but there was refineries um, all along that channel coming back to, um, to Philadelphia, and um, uh, you'd go down and get a load and come back up, and I don't know how many times I did that, but one of those trips would take about a week. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could go to uh, Baytown or Texas City and, or, or Aruba and um, take about a, a week. I mean, uh, uh, that was a, a tanker. Those were tankers. Mm -hmm. And I mean, um, never any trouble. I mean, um, um, well, at that point, you're all in friendly waters at that point. Oh, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. But I mean, I had heard that you, you could see um, subs, and I didn't see any, but standing on the beach, like along New Jersey and New York, you could see, you could see movement out there, mm -hmm. maybe with glasses or, you know, binoculars. Wow. But they were close by. And, and I heard one time that, you know, so, so many times the, uh, the convoys would assemble outside of New York and um, they were, at one time I think they, uh, um, they had subs, you know, bothering those convoys, putting those convoys together with subs in that area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you said you were, you were also shipping eventually into La Havre and yeah, well, I unloaded in La Havre and Rouen, and and I read recently well, after that that La Havre was the worst bomb city in Europe. There wasn't much standing, mm -hmm. and then we would tie up at um, we would tie up at big monster piers, concrete poured, and um, you would find one where you could tie up to a two of them, get the stern tied up to one and the bow to another. And sometimes you'd be, whatever was standing is what you would tie up to. And then you'd unload into barges. Mm -hmm. What was your cargo? Uh, most of it was general cargo. Um, sometimes you would have um, jeeps on, on deck, on the freighters. Uh, you'd have light stuff up on the deck. Okay. Yeah, and then I made one trip into um, or ran when the war was over, and we had, uh, I made two trips uh, when the war was over, uh, and both of those were, um, both of those were um, food for Italy and food for, um, for North Africa. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, um, but um, no, I mean, uh, you were on board wherever, you didn't know where you were going. I mean, uh, and sometimes they didn't even want to tell you. Mm -hmm. I mean, the officer wouldn't want to tell you. Yeah. I mean, but um, you um, took it one day at a time. Yeah. Now, when you were crossing the Atlantic, was at that point in time, how big a problem were the U-boats? U-boats uh, were pretty much all gone. Were they? Yeah, I saw. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I saw where I think 75% of them towards the end of the war was gone. They were, the United States must have just wiped them out. Yeah. But I had friends that I was with that had been on freighters and tankers and uh, had been um, uh, picked up and still back to sea. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I mean, but uh, uh, I think I saw a U-boat in one Italian port that, I mean, I guess it had been, uh, I don't think all it was even there really. I mean, it was tied up to a pier, but I mean, uh, what happened to it, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I read somewhere uh, there were like uh, three million tons of merchant ships sunk during that whole convoy period of time. Well, the figure was 800 vessels. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, when you think about waste, what I mean dollar-wise, yeah. what, what was at the bottom of the ocean? Mm -hmm. And I mean, um, um, I think it was about 800 yeah. vessels. They weren't all American, but 
I think a lot of the Allies had, um, um, England had a lot of them involved, the French had them in. Uh, I don't think Italy had too much of a, of a merchant fleet, but uh, um, all those merchant ships uh, were hauling war cargo. Mm -hmm. Now were they armed or was it? The, uh, the British were. I don't know about the, the Canadian ships itself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, they have a armed guard on board. Yeah, we had uh, we had probably um, twenty two, twenty five armed guard. Mm -hmm. uh, the convoys weren't they escorted by? Uh, uh, most of them were escorted. They had uh, uh, DEs, uh, dis destroyer escorts. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They. Yeah. Right. A lot of the convoys. Yeah. I mean, I think all the convoys had escorts. Mm -hmm. I was on some vessels where um, um, I know I was on one vessel. The guy's name was Bill Hardy, and he was a hardcore commie, and he would preach it in the mess halls all the time. But he was on two or three or four ships that got sunk mm. and get picked up, and he'd go right back and get on another one. Sound like you don't want him on your ship. <laughs> it's bad luck. <laughs> well, the good part about the good part about him was that this freighter I was on with him, I think I made two trips, and like uh, his bedroom was here, and then there was another one. Then the hall turned and went this way, and I was over here, so I was over about thirty feet from um, from his room, and sometimes in rough water, those old those freighters would just lay over like that, oh. and then all at once it would come back. Mm -hmm. And he had a, the, he knew what he was doing, but when we go there so long, I don't know, we might have been counting the seconds, he would open that door in his room and holler lifeboats, and he'd come out of there with his life vest on, and you better be behind him. Really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, Bill Hardy, I never will forget, and he was, and then, uh, um, I'm sure he done this here, but I bet it was 10 years after it was over with, he sends me um, a Communist Party membership book. It's not mine, it wasn't his, mm -hmm. but it was not one of his relatives, might have been one of his kids. Uh -huh. But anyway, uh, it told a message in a book, out on here you had a sign to attend the meeting. And whoever was the member never missed a meeting. Uh -huh. Initials in all the way three pages. Uh -huh. I mean, so it t taught you that uh, somebody taught them to go to meetings. Oh, yeah. Very okay. Sure. Did you ever uh, land in, in Britain itself? Uh, oh, yeah. I was in. Um, um, was it preparation for. No, no. I, was, I wasn't there for the invasion. I was right after that. Later. Yeah, I was in. Um, Bristol and Avonmouth, oh, and I unloaded something that we loaded in Montreal one time, and I unloaded in Bristol, Avonmouth, England. But I think the, the guys I was with, a lot of them, uh, uh, when they before Normandy, uh, they put a lot of cargo at Portsmouth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean that was over on the um, it would be the, it would be the Solid, East Coast. Yeah. yeah. How many? ships are in a convoy normally? Oh, they'd run anything from four or five up to maybe a hundred. Mm -hmm. They say there's like on a, a, a hundred uh, convoys would cover maybe 500 acres. Wow. They would spread them out. I mean, you'd, you'd spread them out. I had, uh, uh, I, I sailed with a lot of guys that run convoys. I sailed with a lot of guys that uh, that um, was on the ships that got sunk and, and survived too. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, and it, you know, it, it, on the convoys, uh, uh, and I think, I don't know what they call a convoy. I think anything over two or three ships was a convoy. But I mean, uh, the ships on the, on the tail end of the, of the convoys, they, uh, they, they called those spots the coffin corners. And then what they put back there was uh, high-risk stuff. I mean, oil tankers or fuel tankers and ammo ships and so forth. And then uh, normally they would head them back on the corners because we weren't supposed to pick up survivors. 
I mean, I don't I mean the DEs could, but the, the freighters couldn't. But they would put the high risk ships in the tail end of the convoy. Yeah. And what was that purpose? I would think are they highly protected then. Well, maybe I don't know. I don't know what the idea was. I mean, uh, but but they they would call uh, the starboard and the port side on the convoys. The last ones were usually high risk, and and they they called them the um, the um, uh, the coffin corners. Mm -hmm. hmm. I tell you, I was reading the thing the other night in one of those magazines. This is kind of funny, but but anyway, um, a, a freighter was loading in in New York, and um, a big semi come down the flatbed, and it had all these big wooden boxes on it, and it had had all the markings on it, but it was ammo, and this this um, freighter had a crewman on it, a 17-year-old kid, you know. And he kept telling this old guy. This old guy said to him, he said, son, he said, um, he said, every time they bring one of those cartons up here, he says, it takes a year off of my life. And the boy said, well, you got to be kidding. He says, I'm on here. He said, I want to see some action. And he said, well, you'll see action before it's over with. So, <clears throat> so um, that was all that happened in New York. And they're over in the channel, or I guess maybe at Normandy, I don't know. And um, the ship got hit. And the kid got blew out in, in the ocean <laughs> or out in the channel, and um, and the, the old guy was with him in the beginning was still uh, on board or nearing somewhere, and he said there was a raft or a board come by and the kid got up on top of it and he, he raised his right hand and he hollered at him and he said hi yo silver, <laughs> <laughs> saw some action. <laughs> <laughs> he was happy he got to see yeah. see the action. Yeah. <laughs> but he said hi yo silver. But anyway, uh, that that could that could be. So, uh, tell us, you were in from uh, what November of '44 up through '47. Okay. <laughs> and what did you do after the war in Europe was was over? I mean, did you? Uh, oh, one. I was with the, when I come back when the war in Europe was over. I hauled a couple loads of. Um, uh, of food. I mean, uh, I lo took a load of grain one time out of Philadelphia to um, ship it to Vakia, Italy, and um, I took a load of. I was in Algiers. I think that was. No, I don't think. I don't know what it was. I mean. Uh, um, well, I took a load out of Montreal one time to Bristol, England, mm -hmm. and one time I was in La Harve in Rouen, France, and and I run tankers for a while. But I ran, I ran tankers before I went to freighters. Mm -hmm. I, I only ran one tanker, and I said tankers. Um, were you ever? Uh, did you have to sign up for a certain length of time uh, when you joined? Honestly, I can't answer. I don't know what I did. I was just wondering, was there any chance that you would have gone into the Pacific Theater from? Oh yeah, Denver? yeah. The, the 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 last vessel I was no, it wasn't the. Uh, I'm sorry, the last vessel I was on. Uh, I think was loading. We was loading something for they go to Panama, but the war ended. I mean, we were, we were loading in Baltimore, I think. I mean, at, at Dundalk or one of those terminals in Baltimore. Okay. Yep. But I mean, um, um, my, my memory's pretty good on most of that stuff. I would say so, yeah. 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 I can see a lot, of, some, a, lot of, a lot of things come back to me that was funny. I know one time in Naples, um, on a Saturday afternoon, we were sitting around in the mess hall just talking and shooting the breeze. And it was about five or six of us. And there was an, a guy that was on board with us, a crew member, that um, he had been through everything you could possibly go through, I, I guess, during the war. But he would tell one story after another, and we was drinking coffee and so forth. So they all decided to go uptown. 
And they, a couple of them went up the night before and they had bars of soap under their hat or cap and you sell it on the black market. So they got caught. <laughs> so uh, old Mike was telling me, he said, oh, you kids, you don't know what the hell you're doing and all that there. He said, well, let's go up town this afternoon and I'll show you how to get by with it. So he put something under his hat and they're all gonna go up to the bar or something and they get out to the gate and the first one they took was Mike and they took his cap off and whatever he had under his hat <laughs> fell on <in> the street. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't. He didn't prove very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I never will forget that was. Uh, but uh, on the and then the waterfront was tough. Yeah. I mean, you had uh, all the drifters in the bed down there, and and sometimes you would have to. Um, you'd have to um, run for your life. Was there a lot of stealing of the cargo? At no. All, or was that pretty well guarded, I would think? It was, I didn't see any of the yeah. cargo, no. It's usually, unless it happened in those big terminals or if they were setting it on the dock or, or there was, but I mean, the cargo went on those ships was put off on the docks and I mean, I never, I mean, I never did see any of it yeah. misused. Yeah. Did you ever see any of the guys you served with? Uh, you have reunions or anything? No, the the last one I saw d died about two, th two, three years ago, and and um, I don't know anybody that was on merchant ships today. I don't know it, not one, mm -hmm. not one. When when the war is over and there's um, the, you're in, you're serving during wartime, but during peacetime, do the ships go back and they're owned by companies? Is that how that yeah. works. Well, the ships are really owned all the time by companies like uh, U.S. Lines and Moore McCormick and American West African Lines and Matson and and Likes Brothers and a whole bunch of them. But I mean, they were on, they were owned by those by those peacetime companies, mm -hmm. and then um, they were under lease to war shipping. And, and when the war was over, I guess the lease, maybe in their contract when the war was over, the lease would end. Mm -hmm. But they would, so some governing body would keep track of these ships and when they need them for wartime, then they would go to those different companies and say, okay, here we go, and, and they signed an agreement with them then. Yeah, I think everything, I think maybe the whole merchant fleet might have been, might, might have operated that way because we had a lot of foreign vessels I mean, a lot of English, and, and um, I guess England and uh, had more, was second behind us with, with ships hauling cargo. Uh, well, at one time, it's, I think they used to say that England would kind of rule the seas with, mm -hmm. with their cargo ships, but uh, um, you'd see a Canadian, maybe Canadian sometimes, but the other countries, you wouldn't see much out there. Yeah. So I guess if those 800 ships that were sunk were owned by private companies, then somehow the government would pay them back, I guess. Is that how it would work? I'm sure it would be that way. See, there was peacetime companies that insured ships, but I mean, um, maybe, I don't know how it all worked. I mean, uh, there was peacetime companies that uh, wrote marine insurance, mm -hmm. and that would insure the, the ship and the cargoes. Okay. Yeah. Now the the, uh, the people that went to Kings Point and went through training when, were th were they uh, full time merchant marine uh, enrolled even in peacetime? Did they maintain a certain uh, force there? And and what were they trained to do? Were they the well? Basically, I would think that that might. It had been a normal thing for the world's trade on the seas for training the officers. Mm -hmm. And then when the war come along, that the need grew for that for officers on all these vessels that were going to be out there. So that accelerated and they put gobs of them through. Then I think that when the war ended, Unemployment had to get bad amongst that group of people because right. they're back to the merchant fleets. Right. Well, it happened before the war. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then uh, 
um, those, um, they still have those groups, I mean, but um, um, I guess taking into consideration um, some of the older ones, you know, passing on, mm -hmm. and then there's probably um, the cruise business now is so much bigger than it was before World War II, I mean, the cruise ships. Yeah. Yeah. So they... I don't know if you, I saw um, the big Italian liner that turned over in Anzio. Um, um, I was on a freighter that got, I don't know what we hit, we got hit something in Anzio. I think it was probably a mine. And um, about two in the morning, and it was an empty freighter, an empty Liberty ship. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> whatever it was, it rocked that big old ship pretty good. Mm -hmm. I mean, then we um, <clears throat> we um, went on into Naples. But um, I, I tell you, I saw something one time that's you I mean really antique. I was unloading in a, on a port in North Africa, and there was a Greek ship came in there, and it didn't have any refrigeration. And on the starboard side, about two thirds back from the bow, they had an area fenced off back there, had a tarp over the top of it, and they had, in one part of it, they had bales of hay. And they had live goats, live pigs, live steers, no refrigeration. Mm. And they would butcher a pig and eat that fresh meat at sea. And, and throw the, you know, the head net overboard, and they would have fresh meat for as long as that would last. There was no refrigeration no on board. refrigeration, Ugh. But I mean, yeah. uh, <laughs> and then I was, you know, one time I was on uh, something that was historical in England, and, and it was, um, um, there was a vessel, a sailing vessel, called the Cuddy Sark. Yeah. Okay, and it's, it's in, in London, right. and it made two trips to China for tea sales. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a no, no, no motors, Sail, sailors. Yeah. And they'd take that thing to China and get a load of tea before they had engines and motors and electricity. That is some sail, isn't it? <laughs> right, and then you yeah. see these guys in the movies hanging up on that pole, switching the sails. Those guys were, had to be real men. Oh yeah, no? oh yeah. But do you have any more war stories? Uh, well, uh, not too, too many. I got hit, hit but the one, the one Liberty got hit at Anzio, but it, it wasn't in the Anzio invasion. It was after the Anzio invasion. And I don't know, what, I, don't, I never did check um, I never did check out uh, much on that. And then I was on one time, uh, I, I, I got uh, on a freighter one time, uh, we had a chief engineer died at sea. And him and I seemed like we would always get the same watches. I know I used to have the 12 to four in the morning and he'd have 12 to four. <coughs> and if you had the 12 to four in the morning, he had 12 and four in the afternoon too. But him and I used to talk a lot, and he died at sea. And, and um, I was just 18 then, and, and I was, I had probably the roughest chief mate that ever got on a ship. But um, um, I, I, I can tell you his name right now, uh, his middle initial too. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, he died, and that morning he died about three in the morning, the chief did up in his room, and about seven or eight, this first mate knocked on the door, and he said, Ed, he said, you and Jack is gonna prepare the body for burial, and I'm 18 years old, and I never did prepare a body for burial at sea. <laughs> and he says, um, as soon as breakfast is over, he said, you come up, he said, we wanna get the body out. So um, we got, we get the body down, we put it on a hatch, and, um, it was a real cruel type deal, the whole thing was. And then um, I got a picture of that somewhere at home too. 
and um, um, we buried it in the sea. I mean, we fit, we um, wrapped the body and put metal in, under the armpits and between the legs so it would go down. Mm -hmm. And and um, um, Jack and I was doing our best, and we had to take a rope and wrap a rope around the body, around the canvas, and I'm doing that real neat-like. And the first mate, uh, um, with that tough guy, he jumped up on the deck and he knocked me down. And he said, you have to get with this or something. He says, uh, he said, coming back from Manila one time, he said, I threw 19 over the side. And he said, you can't screw around like you guys are. And he, and he, he took that rope and we had a rope and he took that rope and he put his foot on it like that until it crunched, you know. Mm -hmm. He didn't tie his damn thing off. So uh, we tied it off and uh, so, um, so we went on ahead with that ceremony. Then we get outside of New York Harbor and uh, the, one of the authors come down and said that um, they wanted to meet the widow at the dock and they wanted Jack, I was my buddy, was with me on that deal, and made it go with the officers and to explain to the widow about that fine Christian funeral we gave her husband. Oh. And I shook my head and I said, I don't want no part of that. Yeah. And I go back to the room, I said, Jack, I said, what do you think? And he said, that's right. He said, this don't have a damn thing to do with it. So we that, didn't. It was not the fine Christian funeral he thought it was going to be. No, it, was, it wasn't what, what the widow was. Yeah, she didn't want to hear that. <laughs> no, all right, but anyway. Uh, and everybody, he, he crunched that rope down and stepped on his body and he said, tie this damn thing off, Ed. And I said, okay. But, uh, wow, that's but, rough. Well, were you about, what, 21 years old when you got out of the service? I was somewhere 20, 21. 20, 21. Yeah, well, I was, my birthday's in September. So tell us what you did when you uh, were out of the service then. Well, I started when I, I back here in Kentucky. I, yeah, right? back in Kentucky. I worked for about three months for the, some part of the government on on uh, keeping records for um, movement of of tobacco. And then after that, there I um, started with State Farm oh. as an agent. But I was also was working with McGregor here in Cincinnati, McGregor Companies. Sure. Weren't they up north of town at the time? They were yeah, they, down, they had it off of, uh, Spring Grove Avenue. Yeah. McGregor Golf was on Spring Grove Avenue. Yeah. And, and Finley and John Street was uh, where they manufactured uh, basketballs and footballs and all that stuff. And then um, I was over there a lot, and I did some work in a a building at 12th and Central Avenue, um, Central Parkway, Central Parkway, Central not, Parkway. not, yeah, Central Parkway, not Central Avenue. Mm -hmm. Okay, I did some work in that, and then I also went with State Farm as a representative in Northern Kentucky, and I'm still there. Oh, really? Yeah, this is my 66th year. Wow. I'm the oldest active agent in State Farm out of about 17,000. Is that right? You still go to work every day, and oh yeah, I've got an office in Covington. I got uh, eight people working for me in the good office. Good for you. That's terrific. Yeah, I got eight. I got eight people in the office with me, and I guess I've been with me a long time. I mean, uh, um, um, I started February. I started with State Farm February one, nineteen forty-eight. Okay. We got maybe on the accounts. Um, I don't know what we got really. I mean, um, I don't know, maybe five thousand or so. I mean, pretty many. Wow, good for you. Are you may I ask how old you are? About eighty-five, roughly. Um, Eighty-seven. Eighty-seven. That's um, terrific. Huh? <laughs> You must have great health. That's wonderful. Well, I'm in pretty good shape, really. I mean, um, I, I mean, so far I'm doing okay. I mean, compared to um, so many that I have yeah. insured, and I, 
I, I do probably um, 25 to 50 visitations a year at funeral homes. I mean, if it's, I'm in the household and somebody dies, yeah. I usually show. Oh, that's wonderful. Tell us about your family. My my family, um, my my father and mother are both deceased, mm -hmm. and then um, my oldest brother is deceased, and um, my wife is deceased. And my second oldest son is deceased. I got, I got um, four living children. Mm -hmm. I got, um, I, uh, I got Tom and Larry, Sue and Jim. I got, uh, and I lost Michael at age 17. Oh, wow. And I lost my wife at age 52. Ooh, that's tough. How many grandchildren do you have? Uh, nine. Each one's got three. Yeah. Each one get three. Yeah. Well, you're you're outliving everybody, all that good health and so forth. And maybe that maybe that salt water air would help me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know. No, but um, count your blessings for what you've got. I mean, uh, a lot of people have losses too. I mean, uh, every day. Well, especially like your wife at 52 and yeah Rosie at 52 yeah. and no time goes on I mean but um, um, like in the office I mean um, it's continuous I have one lady watches the, uh, the the death notices every day in the paper because uh, uh, a lot of those are people we're doing, doing business with well, I think it's great you have the health and you're 87 years old and you go to work every day. That's, that's great. That's great. Oh, well, thanks, though. No. I mean, uh, it's, um, I, I would rather be busy than not. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Okay. Oh, I've just been handing a note. Tell us the story about the war bride. Oh, well, this is, this is, this is a charmer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, let's see. Where where do we start? Okay, we're on a we're on a freighter called the Edward Livingston. It's a Liberty ship, a cargo ship, and we take on a load of uh, grain, wheat, for bread for for um, for Europe. And I'm not so sure we were originally. Uh, maybe we were. I'm not sure what, if we were originally destined to go to Italy, but we ended up in in a city called Chivatavacchia, Italy, which is 40 miles north of Rome. Mm -hmm. And we get over there and the Mediterranean Sea is, um, sometimes you count your, like I say, count your blessings. The Mediterranean Sea is still full of big old black floating mines. Mm -hmm. And some of them have been floating so long they kind of put red lead on them like uh, they do it here on the bridge and then they paint them black and the black paint was off of them. So they might have been out there for a long time. I don't know how long, but anyway, we, we, we don't have any trouble. We, we go straight to uh, the Rock of Gibraltar and we go to Shiva Devakia. And when we get to Shiva Devakia, it was 40, 30 or 40 miles north of Rome on the west coast of Italy. And it was literally leveled. I mean, there was blown all the pieces and the harbor was all screwed up and there was a ship in there unloading and there was one in there that was blocking getting in. So we anchored in, out in the med for four days. And we sat out there and you could see these mines floating around you but none of them hit us. Mm -hmm. So I mean, uh, so finally we went in to unload. So um, unload, okay, well before we, before we left Philly, um, it was on that, on those liberties, uh, like on the deck department, you got like your officer that's on duty on a watch on the four hour span. And then you had um, two able seamen and an ordinary. And the able seamen did the uh, steering on the ships. And um, so there was three of us in a room. Mm -hmm. 
And they put this one man in our room. I was sailing with a guy from West Alexandra, Pennsylvania. We made a couple of trips together and, and um, he knew what he was doing and I kind of thought I did too, but anyway, we got along fine. And they put a third man in, his name was Frank Francis Xavier Lockery. And, and Frank had been through North Africa and he had been wounded two or three times. And then they moved out of North Africa and they went into Italy and he got wounded again, I think at Anzio or when they went into Italy. Yeah. And then he was in the hospital. And then he met this, uh, uh, I guess she might have been a nurse, I don't know what she did, but um, um, uh, the Ivana, uh, Ivana was the wife's name, and, and um, um, let's see, they couldn't get Frank straightened out at the hospital, so they discharged him and sent him home. He come back to the States, okay. And she was over there, but then I guess while she was over there, uh, Frank, I know Frank wasn't over there at that time, she had, she had um, the baby. And the baby's name was Kathy. We called it Kathy or Kathleen, but there's some other part of that adds on to the Italian. I don't know what it was, but anyway. Kathy Lockery was the baby, and, and Ivana was the wife. Well, so he's in our room, and, and um, um, we go into Shiva Tavakya and he disappears. And we were in there for a long time because like the Italians work too hard and they take off two days and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they have a feast day. <laughs> Another feast day tomorrow. Okay, so anyway, so um, he was gone for a long time. And the captain used to, and the first mate to come down and talk to me because, and, and, and uh, Jack about, uh, where's Frank? Do you see Frank? No, we haven't seen Frank. What's he doing? I don't know what he's doing. So one night we was in a bar room uptown or up, well, the, the bar wasn't over maybe a block from the dock area and, and somebody off the ship said, Frank's in your room and he's all dressed up. You'd never know him, but he wants to talk to you. So I, I'll go back with you. I went back and there was Frank. Frank said, what's going on? I said, where in the hell you been? I says, uh, the old man's been asking all kinds of questions want to know from Jack and I where, where you been. He said, well, he said, that's not important. He said, where's this thing going? And I says, the scuttle is, or the word is, we're gonna reload something in Naples and go back home. And he said, that's all I needed to know. And he disappeared and he went, got a cab and went back. So we're still, whatever time, I don't know what time we were still up there, but we went down the coast of Italy and um, that's where we got hit, going down the coast of Italy. So um, we were down in Naples, so the, uh, we put on some cargo in Naples to bring back, it wasn't very much. And um, uh, I had the, what they call the 4 to 8 watch. And when you're doing the 4 to 8 watch at, at sea, when you get in, in, into um, um, the, the port, you can keep that same watch if you want to. So I had the four to eight, so I didn't get off of duty till eight o'clock, but it was the last night in port, and you know how those crews are. They, that was a good night to hit the bars, but I couldn't go because I was um, on duty till eight, but I could go, I could go after eight o'clock. Okay, so at eight o'clock, I'm going across this uh, waterfront down there, boxcars and bums and everything, and you had to kind of protect yourself or look out for the getting rolled. But I go through that there and I, 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 uh, I, I go uptown and um, uh, I'm going uptown and there come a guy from a distance calling my name and it was Frank. So he didn't go, he didn't go down to, in southern Italy on the freighter, he, he come down some other way. Mm -hmm. But he had, he had his wife and baby down in Naples. So anyway, why, um, uh, he said, I'm going to talk to you. He says, let's, let's go back and talk. And, um, and I said, well, okay. So we go back to the ship and we get a um, cab. I guess he got a cab or maybe it was his friend. Well, we go up and to, to uptown in an old hotel and I can remember climbing maybe three or four sets of steps and he unlocks the door and there was Ivana, the little Italian girl, and the baby, and khaki bags that had clothing and that in it. 
And he says, get you a drink? And I said, yeah, if you want to. So I don't know, something was, he says, uh, we're gonna take them back on the, on the freighter with us and we're gonna stow them away. I said, Frank, you're wacky. I said, we're gonna get, <laughs> bad things gonna happen. Oh, yeah. He said, we're gonna do it. So since he had been over there, he had connections kind of made out. Wasn't very long a, a, a Jeep come along and um, um, started to carry those bags out. And we go down to the, down to the pier and, and it's a big wide opening and you know they had shore patrol and MPs and the military police was over here and the shore patrolman was standing over there in front of those little booths, you know? Mm -hmm. And the guy driving the Jeep knew what to do. He didn't go to that shore patrolman because Frank was in the Army. He went to the Army guy. And he looked up, he said, Pier 13. And we got the clearance to go on through. So uh, last night in port, like I was saying, everybody was hitting the bars. So how we carried to the bags and, and, and the baby and all that and put her back in that, on the stern of the ship. <laughs> and it was the magazine locker, it used to have ammo in it. And then um, um, we put her in there and we, the armed guard that we had on board was off the ship, the war was over. So we stole two mattresses out, out of the armed guard quarters and put them on the floor in there. And then um, um, we rigged the door up one, day, uh, one night, I think uh, uh, we could lock it, she could lock it from the inside, but it three wraps and she had unlock it. So um, uh, 26 days coming over. Yeah. And, and I mean, normally that's about 10 or 12 days. Yeah. And, and we'd run some days out there. Um, you have to run one fourth or one half speed or you turn that empty ship over. Mm -hmm. and, and we couldn't make no time, and some days you'd lose 100 miles. And, and it took us 26 days. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> she's in there all this time. Uh, we smuggled food down there. Then we had a big fat guy called Fats, a colored man, second cook. And he would steal food for us out of the kitchen. And, and um, uh, on the freighters at sea, you would never lock your room because it, it, the thief, if he was there, he was on that crew, you know. Yeah. So anyway, so um, he'd bring over a, a, a plate and he'd have uh, something on it and he'd have it covered and then he'd go in our room and I might be up on the wheel and, and whatever the other guys, you know, he'd put it under your pillow and put the pillow on top of it. And that was the food that was later on gonna carry to the back. And then um, um, who was it, um, uh, well anyway, um, we carried the food back and then um, um, and we carried water and so forth. And then we would take turns uh, at night, about 11 o'clock till about three in the morning. We'd bring, the baby usually was always sleeping, but um, um, we'd bring mom up on deck and sit back there and, and, and talk to her. And, and well, one time, I mean, uh, she was teaching me Italian or uh, <laughs> I was fair at it. I, I lost all of it since now, but so um, uh, we get down to, when we come into Fort Monroe, Virginia. Um, it's, it's at the end of the Chesapeake Bay. And um, normally when you come in from overseas, you go right to a pier. Mm -hmm. No pier is available, so we anchor. We're laying out there on the anchor for four days after that 26 days coming over. So finally we come into, um, we come into the, to the pier and very, Fort Monroe is a big army base and the uh, army buses go through it. And normally most of the piers like in New York, there's the pier, walk across the street and you go uptown. Mm -hmm. But this was on a military base and they had a gate out there, way out there, you had to have a pass to get out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so uh, Jack had a pass, I had a pass, I finally didn't have a pass. Uh, uh, Frank had passed. So we get on the bus and we got the baby and we got a little white fuzzy dog called Deanna. She's run alongside. So anyway, so um, the bus drops it off to the gate. We walk to the gate, but they didn't ask her for a pass. It's all set up, <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't know. No pass for her. So we, we go uptown. We go uptown and we get a hotel and they get their own hotel. And, and uh, uh, while we're sitting around 
we went back to the, uh, 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 Jack and I went back out to um, the ship, but I mean, um, so we shook hands and, and said goodbye, and that was the end of it. And I don't even know, I may have had an address on them, but I never kept it. And it was just, that was it. So that was in 45. And in 1998, I saw an ad, and I saved the ad. I got it at home. I got it in the scrapbook. I located an old friend, and it was to, um, to um, in, in California. So um, I sent him $150. And that was to be if my old friend was alive and found him, it was 150. And if he was dead, it was 100. So they kept 100. They wrote back and said, my friend Frank was killed in a car wreck in California. And that, um, that um, the widow was still living and the baby. And there was five children, I think. And in the worst way, they wanted to talk to me or wanted to see me because all this is coming new to them. Okay, so I committed myself to go out and visit with them. And then I got to turn and chicken, and I went down and talked to an attorney, and he said, hell, you don't go yet. He said, you're just making trouble for yourself. He says, you don't go out there. He says, uh, you don't know what they're going to do, but you're, you're going to be part of this. Yeah. So I took my ticket back out in the airport and got my money back. Yeah. So maybe, I don't know, some period of time went on beyond that there. So I, I finally made a deal with them that I would come out on a real quiet basis. And I don't, they had the newspaper, somebody out there was going to talk to me. And I said, uh, that was all out. And this second time was going to be on a real quiet basis. So I went out and visited with them. Really? Yeah, That's yeah. Great. And yeah, they got and that, away with the whole thing. Right, right. Everybody on board must have known it was happening, right? Well, I don't know. I know, like I told you before, one night we was in the mess hall, and, and there was like a four and four seats over at this table, and like two and two over there, and I'm in that back corner, and Frank's over here, and this one guy was pretty much a loud mouth, but he, he kind of said, uh, he looked around, he says, hell, he says, Frank, he says, for all, for all we know, your old lady might be on board here. Yeah. And Frank looked at me. And, uh, I looked at Frank. I said, uh-oh, maybe. Oh. But, but nothing happened out of that. Oh, that's fantastic. But anyway. That's go fantastic. Ahead. Anyway, so, um, so I get a, almost a letter a month from her. I mean, um, she taught school in California. And, and she remarried. And... Um, um, uh, Mama died, but I've got I've got some pictures when I was out there to visit with them. Mm -hmm. But I mean, um, that's pretty much it. But I mean, um, um, I think I there's a, a letter over my desk. I mean, just they complain so she complained so much about the heat in Fresno and oh, yeah. Fresno and Sanger in California, so hot in the summer. But I mean. Um, um, but no, we nothing really. Nobody's ever um, ever approached me on it at all. I mean, um, what a great story! Uh, uh, <laughs> That's fantastic. You see a scrapbook. I mean, yeah. I, they, she sent me the pictures of some of the little Italian kids with their dressed up for for this for one thing or another, and I put it on the scrapbook. And That's and great. she wrote um, she wrote a, 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 a whole story about her family was raised in a poor section in Rome, and, and, and they were married in so and so church in whatever part of Rome, and, 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 and so forth. But I mean, they were, um, uh, I mean, they're good people. I mean, uh, uh, it just um, turned out to be that way. I mean, uh, it's, you know, I mean, I got that scrapbook, I mean, at home, I mean, I, every once in a while somebody will use it. Um, but I mean, it, it's got a lot of, a lot of, it's real interesting to look at. Yeah, okay. I got a lot of pictures in it. Yeah. Well, Ed, thank you. It was a very interesting uh, story you had uh -huh. there, and it ended with a bang. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, well, okay. nice and talking to you, yeah, sir. I mean, it was great talking to you. Oh, uh, I can remember a lot.
uh, uh, I, just like it was. You recall a lot of it, let me tell you. That's oh, great. yeah. 